everyone else who's coming, thank you, thank you, thank you for your support. Yeah. But now we made it here, right? Yes. Yes. We showed up. People invited us, we came, we hopped on the plane, we drove the hours, we, we actually came here and sat down. And now you might be thinking to yourself, now what? Yeah. Right? That's actually a question. Most, of our, most people in our lives will say that over and over again. We'll, we'll, we'll graduate from university and say, no. We'll, we'll get the job, we'll get the girl, get married, have a kid, and no. Maybe even some of us. We become disciples of Jesus, a Christian. We feel the forgiveness and a new start. And it's all exciting, but then, no. And I think about how we, how we always come back to this question. And the only medicine to this problem is knowing your purpose. I'm not talking about another short-term goal or another five-year goal. I'm talking about knowing your purpose. The reason why you came here on earth. But as a cre uh, creation, that's kind of difficult to know, right? Like, hey, I'm, I'm trying to figure out why I've been created. So I think the only way, the only logical way to find that out is what is the creator's purpose for life? When you figure that out, you'll never ask yourself the question again. So that's what we're going to be talking about today. My lesson is simply titled, The Purposes of God. I have three simple points. God's ultimate purpose. God's collective purpose and God's individual purpose. Come on, We're going to start off with point number one, God's ultimate purpose. If you would like to, please turn to 1 Timothy chapter 2. For those that are in the church, we usually email out the lesson so that it's easier to follow along. If someone has brought you along, just maybe nudge them to the left or to the right of you. It, it asks them to email that out to you and you can follow along a little bit easier as well. But this is a complicated question, right? What is God's ultimate purpose? Well, I think for such a complicated question, we're just going to turn to a simple scripture. 1 Timothy chapter 2, 3-4. It says, This is good and pleases God our Savior, who wants all people to be saved and come to a knowledge of truth. Well, that was something. Right? It says here that what God just really wants is two things. He wants everyone to be saved. And everyone to come to a knowledge of truth. But when we're talking about being saved, it doesn't mean, yeah, just become a Christian. But we see throughout the scripture, it means a lot more. It means that he wants to get to know you. He wants you to get to know him. It's not just talking about like a handshake, oh, I know that person. Or I know just Justin Bieber, right? That's not what he's talking about. I'm pretty sure if I went on Google long enough, I can find out a lot about this guy. But no, no, I'm talking about a deep relationship. Come on, John. He's saying here that he wants you to be his friend. Yes. No, even more so, he wants you to be his daughter, his son. No, even more so, he wants you to be in a covenant relationship with him. He says, hey, you can be part of the church, which is just like my wife. You know? But sometimes we, we have that relationship with already with God. And we're like, okay, well, now what, now what do I do? It reminds me of a, of a, of a good tale that I once heard about. An older man that was married for 20 years, speaking to a younger man who was just married for five years. And within their conversation, they were talking about their marriage and how they were doing and how their wives were doing. And the older man boastfully says, I love my wife just as much as I did on our marriage day. And the younger man just looked at him and just, wow, it's really that bad? Come on, Scott. He said, but the older man was surprised. What do you mean? I love her just as much as our wedding day. He's like, shouldn't you learn to love her more by now? Wow. Come on. You, you, you've been married for 10 years. Haven't you found something else to love her more on? Wow. And I think that's the same thing with God, right? Sometimes people say, I'm as just as fired up as the day I was baptized. Mm. That's, that's how bad you're doing? Wow. What do you say? Shouldn't, shouldn't your faith have grown by now? Uh -huh. Shouldn't you have loved more? Shouldn't you have found out more by God and be more fired up yet? Yeah? That's the same thing, right? Because God, He doesn't look at you and think, oh, I just want them to be a friend. For the men out there, when you met that woman that you knew you would not be friends with, right? You met that girl and you're like, there is not an option of being friends with this girl. I think that was when I met T. In the beginning, you know, we met her. This was 
four months before she became a Christian. She was beautiful and everything, but you know, I'm, I'm a Christian. I'm here. So, so I was like, okay, she's not a Christian. So I was like, okay. But then she becomes a Christian. She gets baptized. And for me, I'm still like, I, I, I don't know how I feel because, you know, I haven't seen her really do anything spiritual yet. And so Joe comes up to me, literally like three days after, he's like, bro, you need to take her out on the best date ever. <laughs> First of all, I don't know what kind of date he's talking about. <laughs> Second of all, I was like, no. <laughs> I had some rebellion in my heart. I'm like, I'm not going to let this guy tell me what to do. Um, so, like, you know, a good Christian, I do it anyways. Uh, but I, I take her out on this date, and I can still remember what we did. It was with our dear brothers and sisters, uh, Mason and Natalie Federica, yeah. who were in a church back in, in America. And we had a lot of fun and everything. That wasn't the most memorable thing for me. But it was when we went up to the rooftop and we simply just prayed. And that was the first time I heard Tegan pray. Mm. And that was the time I was like, okay, Joe, I know you're <laughs> And since then, I, I, I was not going to be friends with her. Mm. There was something said in my heart as I'm going to marry this woman. Oh. And it's the same thing when God actually starts to know you more. He does, he is, there is no option for him just for you to be an acquaintance. There is no option for him yet to even know him a little bit. It says in the scriptures that he will turn the world upside down mm. for you to have a better relationship with him. Oh and actually, in the scriptures, he does exactly that. If you'd like to turn to Acts chapter 17. We know the scripture well, but in verse 26 to 27, I'm going to be reading the NIV version of 1984, before my time, but I still like it. <laughs> it, it, it reads here From one man He made every nation of men That they should inhabit the whole earth And he determined the set uh, The time set out for them The exact places where they should live God did this so that they would seek him And perhaps reach out for him and find him Though not, though he is not far From any one of us What I love doing With this scripture Is really breaking down what's going on if you notice right in the beginning, there's, there's a, a little bit of a timeline going on. He says, from one man he made every nation of men. Meaning, since Adam and Eve, way before our time, God has had a notion about putting you in a specific time and a specific place so that you can reach out for him. Since then, he's been planning for this one moment in your life to give you an opportunity to reach out for him. But what I love about here is not just what the Bible says, but what it doesn't say as well. It only has one perhaps in these scriptures. It doesn't say you react, perhaps reach out for him and then perhaps find him. No, no, no. It says when you reach out for him, it is guaranteed that you will find him. Mm. And, you know, I remember that I had my moment to say about eight years ago. Uh, so I'm 26 now, just recently turned 26 on February 4th. And uh, eight years ago, I was 18. Um, now, when I came into church, you can visibly tell I didn't care. Simply because I had this long hair. Uh, you know, I, I just wore like, like nothing. Like, it, it was like I was going to the beach. And you can visibly see that this guy doesn't know what he wants. Um, but I, at that time, I was 18. And I was nearing the end of my high school. And for me, the biggest thing I was looking forward to was going off to university. Because throughout my life, I always just had this notion, I, I wanted to escape my family. I wanted to get out and go. And so university for me was kind of like my promised land. My getaway, my, my, my runaway. But then I started studying the Bible. And when I started first studying the Bible, my brother had become a Christian first, and he tagged me along. And the, since he was going, my family started to persecute me. It was mainly through me. So I kind of knew... Like, when, when I first went to the discussion, they even told me, hey, don't get caught by these guys. You know, don't, 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 don't believe everything they said. So I was going there. I've been going to church for most of my life and everything. I'm, I was like, I'm going to show these guys. What's <laughs> I'm going to teach them what, what the Bible really says. Um, first scripture on Pentecost. Not because of anything it says. It's because I don't know where the book of Psalms is. <laughs> so I sit down. I'm like, I'm going to teach these guys. They're like, open to the book of Psalms. I'm like, amen. Hey, <laughs> then since then, for the next 
two weeks, I really just kind of just, just gave myself over to the Bible studies. I don't know what I'm, I'm doing. I'm just going to learn. I'm going to double check it like a good Korean. But it got to the point where they started to talk about the cost that I had to give up to really become a Christian, to really follow Jesus. And one of the biggest things was the, the university I was going to. It was about a few hours outside of San Francisco. It's called Monterey Bay University. Got a full ride scholarship to go there for kinesiology, and I had someone who was a chiropractor that wanted me to be their protege right after university. He was going to pay for anything else that I had going on. Wow. And um, when I was studying the Bible, they were just like, "Hey, I understand this is really on your part, but do you realize that, that if you go out there, there's not really a kingdom, and your, your faith is going to be weak." And I heard that. In, in my ears, you know, but I didn't really hear that in my heart for a while. I was like, yo, I can do it. I'm going to go out there on the plan of Bible talk and everything. And me and my sister actually drove up eight hours to see the university. And I was like, okay, I'm going to find one person where, where the kingdom is a little bit in their heart. I couldn't find anybody. And I came back with a, with a, with a sore heart, but a soft heart. I got to get it up. This, this, this is the moment. This is the Acts 17. Where God is saying, hey, I'm giving you a chance to know me. And, and I can walk away. Or I can really see and start to meet God for the first time in my life. Mm. I give up my university. My family freaks out. But now, when all my family is like, yeah, hey, you could have been a chiropractor. You could have been all these things. But those mean nothing to me. Compared to knowing God now. Compared to knowing my purpose. All those things were a good plan for my life. But now after giving those up, I have no regrets at all. <laughs> this is your moment. This is the time where God has been planning since Adam for you to get to know him better. This is not just a time coming to church and having a greet and hug. This is a time that God has predestined us. This is an opportunity for you to reach out and to really find you for the first time in your life. Take the moment. Take the opportunity to really know God and fulfill his ultimate purpose. Oh, Point number two, God's collective purpose. If you would like to turn to John chapter 13. So granted that we know God's purpose for our lives to get to know him, but what, what is his collective purpose for us? Right? We're all individuals, but what does he want from all of us? Let's read here, John 13, verse 34 through 35. It says, the new command I give you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples, if you love one another. Yo, many will read this and say, of course. Yo, I, I know this. Everyone knows this. Love everyone, right? We need to love everyone. Well, not quite. What's the difference between Jesus saying love everyone and love one another? Very two different commands. Right? If I had you in this room and I said, hey, guys, the new command from Jesus is to love everyone. You'd be looking out the window. I've got to love that person over there. I've got to go over here. That person that gave me coffee this morning. Right? you got to love everyone. But if I turn to you and I say, hey, love one another, then you're looking out to your left and to your right. The people that are around you. And that's what Jesus was here was saying, is that one was, you know, loving everyone was a vague, indirect uh, in instruction. But this other one was a personal relationship with those that had been made into disciples. Mm. And the impact of this relationship, the impact of this love, it says that they will know. <clears throat> that most people are concerned, hey, how do we get the word out to everybody? How do we tell everyone about the kingdom and about God? It says here, don't just tell them, but show them. Show them by your love. Mm -hmm. When people look at your love, that they're not second-guessing or doubting where the kingdom is, but that they look at your love and they say, oh, I know that they are disciples. Mm -hmm. I know they are Christians by how they love each other. Amen. And I think that, that was the same thing that happened to me when I first came to church. All those years ago, uh, I remember the first church service I went to. I didn't really like it. <laughs> to be honest, because I came from a big church, a Pentecostal church, that was about 3,000. And with that, every Sunday, they had like this big digital clock on the watch. And it would be a countdown of 50 minutes. 
right when the sermon would start and right when it would end. And usually between three minutes when it was about to end, you start to see everybody start getting up to go to the cars because they want to beat the traffic. And so, so that was the church that I grew up in. I was like, on the dot, three minutes, here we go, right? So I, I was used to these uh, superficial relationships. But when I came to church, it was a church actually smaller than this. And yes, there are churches smaller than this one. Um, it was a newly planted church in, in Long Beach, California. And I came and it was like 10 people. And I must have come to one of their special services because they had what, what we do is a good news sharing. So people uh, raise their hand and share about good things that are happening in their life. And some 30-year-old man that I didn't even know starts sharing good news about me. <laughs> and I, I was like freaked out. I was like, who is this guy? You know? <laughs> He's all excited. You know, and Eric's brother's here. He's studying the Bible. I was like, how did he know that? You know? <laughs> and, and, and I walked away a little bit, little bit like weird and out. But I also walked away knowing I was going to come back. Mm. Because I saw that the love that they had there was genuine and yeah. Come on. That when I, when, when I saw their love, I saw that they truly loved God. Why? Well, remember what Jesus says about the two greatest commandments. You don't have to turn there, but in Matthew chapter 22, 37 through 40, it says, Jesus replied, Love the Lord with your God, with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the prophet and the laws hang on these two commandments. This is the only time within the Bible, Jesus compares your love for God to anything else. He says, your love for God, the only thing that is ever like it is your love for your neighbor. It's your love for other disciples. So when someone goes around and asks, hey, how is it to love God? What is it like? They should be able to point to your relationships in the church and say like that. Yes. Wow. Like that. Did you see how they love each other? That, that, that's how the love of God is. And you know, as a church, we're, we're doing uh, to the best of our ability to show them. See, God loves each and every one of his children, and so do we. Come on. You know, we welcome all, no matter what background or, or diversity that they come from. You know, though we're a small church, we have members representing ethnic backgrounds from Tonga, Samoa, America, New Zealand, Australia, Puerto Rico, you and, you know, even China and Hong Kong. You know, we have ages ranging from 16 to Joe. You know, we we can give the rainbow a run for its money for how many skin colors we even have. Where no matter where you come from, you are loved and welcomed. That's right. See, like God, who loves all to the point of knowing the number of hairs on their head. And he's grateful for Ian to have a little bit less to count. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I appreciate it. Uh, but uh, no matter where you're coming from, it says here that, that by the love we can see God's love. Yes. Yeah. And not only does this love impact many and all from different walks of life, but it also gets those, those little stories that you remember. You know, when reflecting on personal stories that I, that I have that have been impacted by the love of the family and the church, None are more memorable than the story of our sister named Carmen in the Sydney. Yeah. 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 Come on. To give you a background of her, um, she, she's a single mother of a child uh, of nine years old, and she's a P PhD student in Sydney University. Mm -hmm. And she was reached out actually by our brother Brandon, who's the intern now in the Hong Kong church. Mm -hmm. And at first, she wanted nothing to do with them. Now I'm not talking about, she simply wanted to reject it because she went to like some Catholic high school and God wasn't for her anymore. No, no, no. She came from Iraq. And where she saw dead bodies on the streets because people were doing God's bidding. And so when she heard God, she was like, there is no way anyone's going to convince me to fall back. No way. But if you know Brandon, he talks to her for 10 minutes, 20 minutes. 30 minutes just trying to convince her to come out. He had last flying Tegan and says, Tegan, you got to get her number. Tegan don't freak out what's going on. She comes over though and Tegan gets her number, but right when she's passing her number, Carmen says to her, don't you ever call me or ever text me. So of course Tegan texts her the next two days. Uh, and, and to her surprise, she actually starts to come out to the Bible discussion. And by God, the first Bible discussion that they do is 
the woman caught, caught in adultery. And where Jesus forgives the woman and doesn't love women. And she started to see the love in the church, but there was something still in her heart that was just like, it's, it's a little bit too good to be true. What I've seen around the world, there's, you can't paint over that that easily. But it wasn't until that Carrie actually gave her Elena's book, Elevate, which is Jesus' global revolutionary uh, revolution for women. And she started to read it, and she got blown away, yeah. understanding that God actually loves women as well. Yeah. I remember hearing the stories from Tegan, where Carmen would come up nearly in tears and ask, so, so what you're saying is that this, there's no punishment, punishment for me in the church if I do a sin? Tegan's like, no, no, God loves you. You're talking about if I sin, you're not going to punch me or hurt me or hit me. Tegan's blown away. No, no, of course not. So you're saying God loves women as much as he does men? And she was blown away to tears about how much God loved her. Yeah. She gets baptized. Yeah. It's an awesome celebration. But what was, what was uh, more special is because of her background coming from a Muslim background, her becoming a Christian is actually a life and death situation. Yeah. And so she had to change her name. I don't remember what her name was before, and I actually can't say her report. Anyway, <laughs> but uh, we changed her name. We asked her, hey, what would you like your name to be? And she's like, hey, I, I actually like the name Carmen. Mm -hmm. Carrie's like, okay, well, well, why Carmen? Well, I was reading Elena's book, and in there it says that Carmen is her bigger sister. Aww. And I want to be just like that and go baptize more Elena's. This woman really understood the love of God. understand this elective purpose of God. Then we understand that God didn't just simply bring you here this morning to attend church. But instead to love. And love to the point where people don't just like it or are impressed or that was a fun church. But love it to the point where people know that God is in this building. Yes. Where people look around, where is God? They can't find it in their hearts around the world. But they say, I know that one church. There is God in there because they love. And that's what God is calling us here today. Come on. Okay. Not just for a few. Not just to change some names. But to change many names. And the world will know that there is a God. want to please turn to Genesis chapter 19. Point number three, God individual purpose. For this, we're going to be looking at two lives of two brothers who you will actually find in heaven. We're going to be looking at the life first of Lot and in contrast to the lot of the life of his uncle Abraham. First, we're going to look at Lot as he's escaping from Sodom and Gomorrah. Before the destruction of the Lord comes down on it, raining out soul. We're going to read here Genesis 19, verse 17 through 22. The angel of the Lord has come here before Lot. It says here, As soon as they have brought them out, one of them said, Free for, uh, Flee from your, for your lives. Don't look back. Don't stop anywhere in the plain. Flee to the mountains, or you will be swept away. The Lot said to them, No, my lords, please. Your servant have been found in... in uh, your servant have been found, uh, found favor in your eyes, and you have shown great kindness to me in sparing my life. But I can't flee to the mountains. This disaster will overtake me, and I will die. Look, here's a town near and not to run to, and it is small. Let me flee to it. It is very small, isn't it? Then my life will be spared. He said to him, Very well, I will grant this request to you. Uh, two, I will not overthrow the town you speak of, but flee there quickly. Because I cannot do anything until you reach it. That is why the town is called Zahar. So it says here that the angel came before Lot. And he was sparing the life of him and his family. But Lot, he was called to run to the mountain. But instead in his heart, he's like, no, I just, I just want to go to Zohar. It's not very full, uh, far away. And Zohar actually means small. He's like, I can't make it all the way to the mountain where you are calling me to go. I just want to go to Zohar. And Lot is really just showing this notion that when you are destined for the mountain, but you settle for the plains. There's a saying out there that says, most do not fail because they aim too high and miss, but because they aim too low and hit. They aim low in their ambitions. They aim low in their dreams. 
in their righteousness, in their relationship with God, they aim low, and they hit, and they think that that's enough. That I would just settle here in my little old zone. See, when we become disciples of Jesus, whenever you become a Christian, we understand that we no longer define good in our lives, right? That we can't say what's sin and what's not. That, 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 that's up to God. That's right. But sometimes we still bring into the church or into our Christianity defining great. Mm -hmm. That God defines good, but I'm going to define great for me. I'm going to define my limits I'm going to go to. I'm going to define how far I'm willing to go. But I'm still saved. I'm still doing what's good. But, but instead, the same way that we let God define our good, we have to let Him define our great as well. That we cannot just settle in our little limitations. But I understand why we can do that sometimes. Sometimes we limit how far we will be willing to go because we have seen where we've come from. I think I did that for a while in my own life. So growing up, my father passed away when I was two from AIDS. He was a doctor and he was actually working on a cure for AIDS and not knowing so much about it back then, it some splattered to his eyes and he actually contracted it. So he passed away at the, uh, when I was two, never really knew. Uh, because of that, my mom, my mom just, just, just freaked out. From two to seven, she got, from the night, she, she started getting heavily addicted to drugs. Uh, we were moving in and out of uh, hostels and hotels, and it got to the point where I wasn't going to school anymore. So the police came and picked and took me and my brother away from my mom. We were gracefully adopted into family, but later on my mom contracted AIDS as well, and she passed away when I was 14. And with that, growing up, I always had this kind of chip on my shoulder, and limited myself with how far I can actually go. I'll say things like, you don't understand, I never had a father. You don't understand, I, I was away from my mom, I was taken away. You don't understand, I, I was in an orphanage for a year. And I look back and, and I limit how far I was going to go. But it's a powerful moment when you realize that everything you have been through was building you up for everywhere where God was going to take you. It was a powerful moment that I realized that I, I did not limit how far I'm willing to go just because of my past had a little bit of trouble. But in realizing that life didn't just happen to me, it happened for me. Yeah. It happened to give me strength. It happened to give me conviction. To give me a heart. To give me a, a life of compassion to look out and say that the world is hurting. And I cannot just limit myself but go to the greatness of God to change many others' lives. Amen. See, Lot was created and crafted to go to the mountain. But he settled for little old Zoa. Mm -hmm. And we'll never know how great he could have been. We'll never know how far he could have been. You know, yes, Lot, he died and he's in heaven. He is going to be, he was saved. But still, who else could he have changed? Now let's look at Abraham and see the difference of his choices. Turn just a few chapters later on in Genesis chapter 22. Come on, John, come on, come on. verse 1 and 2. Genesis 22. Sometime later, God tasted Abraham. He said to him, Abraham, here am I, he replied. Then God said, take your son, your only son, whom you love, Isaac, and go to the region of Moriah. Sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on the mountain I will show you. Wow. Talk about having a need-to-know conversation. There was no explanation. There was nothing. You know, the, the second sentence that came out of God's mouth, hey, get Isaac and go to the mountain. Kill him. Okay, let, let's see how Abraham reacts. Continue on. Early in the early the next morning, Abraham got up and loaded his donkey. He took with him two of his servants and his son Isaac. When he had cut enough wood for the burnt offering, he set out for the place God had told him about. Wow! There was no explanation, but there was no hesitation from Abraham. Oh, uh, that early in the morning, he got he was excited to do the will yes. of God. He had this. He understood walking up there, nearing the tip of the mountain, that this was going to be a big sacrifice. But he had a trust in God that it was going to be okay. But I, I wonder, though, knowing that there was going to be a sacrifice, his son speaks up and has this heart-wrenching conversation with Abraham. Hey, hey, Dad, we, we have the wood. We, we have everything we have. 
Where is this sacrifice? And Abraham just simply, God will provide the sacrifice. Jump down to verse 12. So he's about to dare to sacrifice Isaac. It says, but the angel of the Lord called out to him from heaven, Abraham, Abraham, here am I. He replied, do not lay a hand on your boy, he said. Do not do anything to him. Now I know that you fear God, because you have not withheld from me your son, your only son. It says here that, yes, Abraham had an amazing relationship with God. But it wasn't until the point that he was willing to sacrifice his son that God says, now I know because of your obedience that you fear me. It goes on through verse 15 through 18 about how God was going to bless his descendants. And but you would have thought about God, uh, Abraham going up to the mountain right there. That Abraham knew that going up to that mountain, knowing the sacrifice would be great, but that the reward would be even greater. Now, I love to look around and remember stories where people had great sacrifices, but great rewards. Yeah. There was once a young man born in the West. He knew of God because he had a religious family, but he never could really claim a relationship with God. So he came to the kingdom the first time. And at first, he was a little bit critical. He didn't really like the person who studied the Bible with him, but you know, he got through it. He gave up smoking. He gave up all these different things. And you know, he became a Christian. He, he fell in love with God in the kingdom. The story goes on that you know, he joined the movement of God. He married way beyond his ability, as most men do. <laughs> uh, and everything was going great for a while. Uh, until it wasn't. Until the kingdom broke. And, and the kingdom was hard to find around the world. So he moved back to his country and tried to find remains of the kingdom there. But there, there wasn't really many, many things going on. He couldn't find it, so he decided to start his own little bit of the kingdom. There has been many days where he sat on his porch as he saw that nobody was becoming a Christian and asking himself, was it all worth it? Mm -hmm. So he gets a call from L.A. says, hey, you, you need to come on over. We've started the kingdom again. He gets a call and he says no. <laughs> but then another call comes. This time he says yes. Mm. At that moment, he had to give up his job where he was well making over $100,000 a year. And he gave it all up. He sold his house, moved to L.A. And once again, he saw that the dream was being lit around the world. Mm. Now, Joe Lewis can be the father of many, building many churches. <laughs> She has been an equal part in being the mother of many countries. Yeah. Yeah. And you see this. You know, we pass out, and there's a lot of different papers on your seats, but we have there the Crown of Thorns Project. See, before I became a Christian, my favorite color was blue. But now it's green. <laughs> what we have there is we have three different colors. Green is a church that we've been planted. Purple is where we have a remnant, a small group waiting for a church to be planted. And red is where we have not had the kingdom yet. But I love, since becoming a Christian since 2011 till now, the, the year that it just turns green, it's magical to see those colors change on that. And now to be here, the 98th church in the movement. <laughs> but 2020, phase three will be done. But that's not where it's going to stop. Mm -hmm. You know, not only here are we just going to Auckland, but we're going to go be, go be going to the different cities of, of New Zealand. Mm -hmm. Not only that, but we're going to be going to all the, the little islands of the Pacific. And it's just exciting to know that. See, you can be saved, but not fulfill your destiny. Mm -hmm. yep. You can be destined for the mountain, but settle for the plains. Yeah. But you need to realize that you guys are destined for the mountain. You are made for greatness. Something beautiful is to come out of you. And we forget that sometimes. But the world is eagerly waiting for you to realize it. The moment that you realize that greatness is made in you. And you realize the mountain that God is calling you to. See, going to the mountain, yes, is going to cost us. It's going to cost a lot of us many things. But the, the, the rewards far outweigh the price. Yeah. 
So this calling is not to just simply settle for the plains when you are destined for the mountain. See, in conclusion, you know a little bit more of the purposes of God. You know that he wants to get to know you. You know that he doesn't just want this mediocre relationship with you. Yeah. Or to get stagnant in his relationship with you. To connect, to know you deeper and deeper. You know that he wants to build a, 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 a church where people can go to and say, hey, that, that's what God is. That's what the love of God is. That's what people are looking for. You know that God has created you for, for, for the mountains in your life. But now it's always back to that first question. Now, now you know. But only you can decide what, what you're going to make of it. Only you can decide, it. am I going to settle for Zohar? Or am I going to head to the mountains? Give up the cost. See what God has in front of me. And head to the promises of God. And to the love of God. And thank you very, very much.